So before Spider-Man and before the X-Men, one Marvel superhero made the successful leap to the big screen and kicked a whole lot of ass in the process with Wesley Snipes as Blade. Born of a mother freshly bitten by a vampire, Blade is a daywalker, a mortal man with the strength and abilities of a vampire, but able to walk in the daylight. However, he still suffers from their bloodlust, which his mentor Abraham Whistler attempts to quell with a specialized serum, which is losing its potency. In an underground rave, Blade wrecks shop, taking out several vamps in the process and leaving Quinn, the errand boy for the arrogant and brazen Deacon Frost, charred to a crisp. Yet when he revives in the hospital, hematologist Dr. Karen Jensen is bitten, and against his usual judgment, Blade takes her to be treated by Whistler. Meanwhile, Frost stands in opposition to the rigid and secretive Vampire Nation, and is in the process of uncovering an ancient ritual to unleash the blood god Lamagra. Once this is done, the entire world will be washed over, leaving all mortals as vampires. Blade and Whistler work with Karen to formulate a cure for vampirism, as the Daywalker barrels through the vampire underworld to uncover Frost's plans and bring him to an end. Yet a heavy toll will be taken from Blade, and an unsettling revelation will injure him further, as the Blood God puts him to the ultimate test. So being released on the cinema screens on August 21st, 1998 from New Line Cinema, Blade became the very first financially successful theatrical release adaptation of a Marvel comic superhero, grossing $131.2 million worldwide of a $45 million budget. And it's kind of an interesting thing how this came out in a certain period of time Right after you had stuff like Batman and Robin and the Spawn movie and stuff like that where these comic book adaptation films were coming out and they just weren't hitting the mark, they weren't being critically successful, not being terribly well received by audiences and feel kind of viewing as this whole first wave of such that started with like 1990's Batman and it really kind of crashed and burned, fizzled out and kind of lost its way entirely. But with this type of film, it's like so many people probably went into this film in 1998 not even realizing or even picking out the little credit at the beginning of the film that this had anything to do with a Marvel comic whatsoever. They just viewed a badass action movie with Wesley Snipes battling vampires in a cool, slick type of film. They really didn't see comic book or whatnot. They just saw a nice high concept type of idea here executed in a very stylish fashion and it just connected with a lot of audiences and people really enjoyed it, really just found it very entertaining and exciting. So it was such a great thing to have a project like this, which was championed by David S. Goyer, the screenwriter of the film, and of course, the eventual director, Stephen Norrington, who had done special makeup effects work on films like Gremlins and Life Force, Aliens, uh, Split Second, a whole bunch of stuff there, and previously directed the film Death Machine. Having these guys kind of champion this thing, where New Line scene was almost kind of looking at this thing as kind of like a a spoof comedy film, probably in the vein of, vein of some really bad films that come out like Dracula Dead and Loving It or Vampire in Brooklyn. So they weren't really taking the concept seriously. They, they saw something that they, did, they didn't grasp the, 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 the quality, what you get out of the source material. Thankfully, a guy like David Escorio grew up on Marvel and DC Comics, all this type of stuff that had a very strong knowledge of this type of stuff and had a respect for it really kind of championed going for that serious take, going for a much more respectful type of approach towards the material and crafting something that'd be much more updated from the much more 70s sort of black exploitation esque type of comic books you had where this whole thing started out like Tomb of Dracula, stuff like that, and bring in much more of a, a modern sensibility, kind of adapted in something that feels a little bit more contemporary or whatnot that can relate to audiences, kind of drive forward a much more of a a stylish type of action film of sorts and you're getting someone like Steven Norton involved who definitely had a lot of strong vision as a director to really create a style for this whole thing to 
production design to have a much more of a, a sleek type of sensibility towards how you manufacture the, the weapons, the guns, the, the knives, the, the swords, all that type of stuff, and creating all the different locations in the whole film to have a just sort of a slight, almost like a slight futuristic sheen and sleekness to everything. Just had a, a great eye for creating this entire world in a subtle type of fashion to have a certain quality to it all, to have it all kind of meld together in this sort of urban environment that the entire film is unfolding in and everything. He had a really good strong eye to that and have that sort of almost visionary director and a very solid screenwriter there to meld these ideas together and kind of bring it all together in that sort of serious tone of the film here that you had that that sort of somber sense about everything with these characters but it still has the sense of humanity there's a cer certain sense of levity to certain moments in the whole film that allows the characters to be much more accessible and much more open to the audience and everything like that you can relate to the characters there's that that quality about everything that keeps it light where it needs to but it still maintains a consistency of a, a of a reality to it and everything i like the sense that this feels like just how blade says in the whole film that there's another world underneath the one that you know so it feels very much on the surface like our own world but then you have all the vampire underworld stuff going on beyond that and it just kind of feels like this could be our reality here with all this other stuff happening underneath it so i just like the approach that it didn't go overly stylish to a comic book extent they maintained a reality that that was believable and convincing to it all and everything and a lot of that has to do with the rent fantastic cinematography that's put together by theo van de sant that just strikes a really powerful chord with the anamorphic lenses that he uses for the whole film and just the sense of weight and gravity that it gives the whole film with the the way they color grade the whole film with a lot of blues and whatnot it just has it's a certain strength to a certain presence to the cinematography to give the film an overall mood and atmosphere just have a a solemn somber sense of things it's not like a lot of handheld camera movement or whatnot there's a lot of steady shots or whatnot in the film whether they're just like lockdown stuff or panning shots or even just some really nice push-ins here and there just like everything just has a steadiness to it and how it's all filmed and stillness to certain moments that just have it just brings out the weight of the drama and certain sequences and the introspective nature of the character of Blade as well. So I think so much of the cinematography of the film just really strikes a fantastic chord to exude the type of ambiance that the film really wants to delve into for the characters and the tone of the story and everything else it has going on for it. It just looks like a really good and stylish picture. It's a really good piece of work and just like... I really like how they build the mythology in the whole film because we've got a lot of vampire films over the decades and decades with a lot of different mythologies pulled from different types of things and it's nice for a vampire film by this point in time to really establish what its mythology is, what exists in this in reality and everything. So they throw out the crosses and the holy water type of stuff. It's much more down to much more of a scientific type of thing with the silver and the garlic and the sunlight and everything. So I like how they kind of boil it down and keep that sort of sense of grounded reality to the whole thing. That there is sort of a, a genetic mutation of sorts that happens with vampires and everything. So I just really like the idea of how they go about building mythology and building the overall world with the whole thing with the vampire council and how they're integrated in all these sort of backroom type of deals and whatnot with humanity everything to maintain their presence and their kind of stranglehold on certain things in the world. So it's like it's, it's really interesting how they kind of meld an idea of like a organized crime a syndicate or something like that with the vampire nation and just have also more supernatural type of things like this blood god idea in the whole film so like all these interesting things that keeps a certain sense of grounded reality but also is has room for much more fantastical type of things like that in the whole thing so it has grounded emotions grounded characters grounded sensibilities but it has room for much more threatening larger implications of stuff like that and talking so much about blade himself here wesley snipes was absolutely the perfect guy to take on this role at this point in time because no one else at his star power with his caliber of quality would have brought as much as he did to the table mainly because of his martial arts training aiding this film to such an amazing extent having started training since he was 12 years old in Hapkido, Shotokan Karate, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, kickboxing, a bunch of other disciplines as well 
I don't think it really got much of a chance in other film roles to really kind of showcase that type of quality, those types of skills for the screen. This film absolutely positively allowed him to bring all that up to the forefront of what he could possibly offer to such an amazing type of film. But his performance can't be overshadowed either because, again, it taps directly into the tone that Norrington won the whole entire film to have here, that that brooding sensibility that this character has, that he has such an internalized quality with everything he's dealing with, 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 with the war between the sort of the vampire bloodlust and the, the human side of him, this entire thing going on throughout this entire film. He's, he's such a intense, driven character that doesn't have... <laughs> the great, the great sense of tact to him and everything. I, I love the whole, I love the whole thing that he's, he's got a kind of a, a humor and a wit to him as well. That he, ha, he has the, the, the brooding nature to him, but he still has a certain humor to what he does and stuff like that. And uh, the bluntness of how he deals with certain situations where he's got the, uh, the, the, the one familiar cop in Karen's uh, apartment and everything, and he starts bash him around her entire apartment, wrecking shop and everything. He really doesn't need to be doing that, beating him up to this extent and wrecking your freaking place. But he has, has such like a bullish mentality that's like, the rest of this stuff in this entire world really doesn't have any sort of consequence towards him. Just like, it doesn't really matter. These, these, subtle, these little things in the world are kind of oblivious to him or whatnot. So it's like, he's just, he's so focused on the entire Deacon Frost and just wiping out the suckheads and all that type of stuff just like all these things just like they're just stuff in his way and just a wonderful type of thing just creates a certain a humor about the situation and whatnot that he's being so being so bullish it's it's kind of nice how the film progresses in a certain way that even when he has that confrontation with frost has that kid kind of kind of as a collateral or whatnot it does try to go after Frost to a certain extent, but he still goes off and saves the kid before it's too late. So there's that, that slight anti-hero quality about the character that it is so thoroughly, rigidly determined to, to take out the guys that he just absolutely just despises the living ends, but it still has a nagging thing in the back of his head. That's why he, he, he takes care in a way and tries to help her because he has that flashback to his mother and everything. So it's like, he still has that little, that pull towards himself, those little strings on his heart or back of his head, those little memories or whatnot that still tethers him back towards a humanity that doesn't keep him so dead cold. There's so little bit of that towards him to make him relatable, not condemnable. So he still has that slight bit of humanity in, in himself to make sure that he still doesn't kind of go off towards that end where he's just vigilante and vengeance and all that type of stuff. He still, still has that sense of doing what's right and what's wrong and whatnot. So I like, he's a little bit more complex under the surface. So I really like how the direction worked out, how the performance of Snipes worked out. The character has created a very compelling character that just pulls you all the way through the entire film from the very first moment to the very last one. I actually love what Snipes did here. And working off of Chris Christopherson, you couldn't ask for a better goddamn thing in the world for that type of character of Whistler here, creating a much more of a an old rugged cowboy sensibility. It's like, you get Chris Christopherson, that's so much what you get with the, the texture, what he brings to a character. I just love just the sensibility between these two characters that, 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 that they are very masculine type of characters. They don't really kind of just kind of gush out emotions or whatnot. They're very kind of reserved in a certain way. They have a almost like a tough love type of thing going on towards they don't really have to uh, externalize their emotions they have a certain bond a certain strength between them that's very much unspoken but i just like that they, they you you get whistler telling the backstory of how he found blade how he kind of nurtured him kind of uh, raised him towards his end of what he is now and everything to make him more of a warrior against vampires just like the, the the damn scene where blade comes back after frost had kind of wrecked shop and left Whistler pretty much for dead and everything just like that entire scene is a brilliant piece of talent through everyone's ability there between the acting of Snipes and Christopherson and just the, the, the direction Norrington brought to that scene. I think that's the sort of pinnacle moment of style of direction that you see from this director here that you just, just the, the how Blade is just kind of dabbing the blood on his neck and everything just like it's just a beautiful piece of subtlety and just seeing 
how the, the wheels are turning inside of Blade's head and how he's trying to cope with this whole thing. And you, you don't have to see these characters bellow out tears or whatnot. You can see and feel the emotion in the whole scene just by these little subtle beats or whatnot. And just, just the, the respect they have for one another there and all that type of stuff. Just like it's a beautifully, masterfully done sequence that any seasoned director would definitely envy and type of stuff. So to have this as Norrington's second film and be that solid a director here is a very impressive type of thing, especially working with such seasoned actors at this point in time. Just have that steady hand, su such a great handle on these characters and the ability to work with the actors and get that sort of sensibility and that weight and that, that perception into the characters. It's a very vital type of thing in this whole film. And definitely getting <laughs> Stephen Dorff in this film I heard people kind of say back and forth about his character of Deacon Frost, but I absolutely love this character because he is such a slimy piece of scumbag trash. That he's just a, the, the Weasley piece of crap character. They just can't fucking wait to see Blade just shove a fucking sword up his ass. This guy is, is, is such a great character in a certain way that Dorf is absolutely fantastic in this whole thing. He's just like, he wanted to play the character with a certain... Uh, a charisma source. Wanted to play him a little bit kind of not just intense mean type of villain or whatnot. He wanted to have a little fun with the character. They kind of played up a little bit but not choose this choose the scenery which I like that because you got Donald Logue there to chew up enough scenery as a sort of comedic sidekick of sorts that I've heard other people not quite like his performance so much but I do generally enjoy what Donald Logue brought to the entire tone the the feel of the whole film really liked his character so much but Dorf just has that sort of again that weaselly quality that I love that he kind of relishes being this sort of defiant type of thing in this vampire nation that's all very rigid with its structure and its rules and type of stuff so you got this one guy who just doesn't give a flying fuck about any of that type of shit and just gonna he's gonna shake things up do things the way he thinks it needs to be done to take a stranglehold on the entire goddamn world by unleashing the blood god and it doesn't matter who's pure blood who's not everyone's gonna be turned into a kind of like a vampire and everything so i just like that this this is a, a villain who's trying to shake up the goddamn establishment just like that he is kind of a good reflection this, this character that reflects the kind of boldness that blade has that he also has a certain sense of boldness to him that these two characters really kind of reflect and kind of work off each other really well to have a certain contrast but also a complementary nature between how they go about things how their sensibilities and the sort of brashness sort of kind of are compatible with one another as adversaries here just like they're a really good fit and just like i couldn't imagine there being a different villain in this film than that i can't imagine not having someone who's just kind of like that much of a kind of a snake in the grass type of character that you can just kind of grow to hate but still be very entertained by i just like steven dorf doing what he's doing in this whole film just like he, like i said he's relishing every moment of it but he's not chewing it up too much so it's like i really like the the, the temperament that he found for the character and the performance here i thought it worked really really well and just like so much of his performance really kind of slightly affected the original ending, the change of the ending of the film, because they did have a test screening of the film, and they had a, the original ending of the film had Frost being enveloped by the Blood God, becoming this sort of towering maelstrom of blood spinning around the entire friggin' temple and everything, and Blaze got to fight this uh, CGI monstrosity of a blood uh, hurricane and whatnot, and. Testimonies really just didn't like that one. They were odd and finished effects, and that didn't help things much. But uh, you, you see so much what Dorf does in the film that you just want, like I said, you just want to see Blade fuck him up. At the end of the film, you just want to see him fuck him the hell up. You got to kind of put, put aside again the whole sort of wa blood god wash of the entire world type of stuff. Just like, at the end of the day, it's between Blade and freaking Deacon Frost, and you need to see these guys throw down and get that fucking come up, and you gotta see that type of thing pay off the end of the film. That's so much what it's building up towards. You really wanna see him just get what's coming to him and everything. And I really like Nabouche writing this whole thing as Dr. Karen Jensen here that I like the fact that this character, she's not helpless, she's not a damsel in distress, and she's not someone who's not valuable to the story and the character of the film. They really 
built this character as one very intelligent, very resourceful type of character. She, she can handle herself very well. She's very savvy. She's very knowledgeable about how to protect herself in certain situations. And she's, she becomes valuable to the plot because of her uh, area of expertise in the whole film, that she is very much uh, someone who, a hematologist who can study the vampire blood and try to find another cure for this entire vampirism because she's been bit so she's just a great character in this whole thing and she Nabouche White just really does a fantastic job to bring a quality to it have a great chemistry with Wesley Snipes and just have such a really good quality to herself in general that she's just as much of a vital character as anyone else in the film she really holds her own very strongly in the whole thing and just like I like just the quality of it all and they didn't have any illusions to make it a romantic interest like a lot of other comic book films seem to want to kind of do to kind of introduce a female character and there's got to be some kind of relationship that builds up she stands at her own and she does her own good stuff and she brings something more into the entire context of the film i really like that and she's great she's a great character and portrayed by a really damn good actress i really like this whole thing it's like there might be one or two minor characters in the film that are not really portrayed very well but anyone in the main cast of this film just nails the hell off it in my opinion just like i think everyone had great chemistry that everyone gelled together everyone just fit their characters so very well and brought something extra into the mix of the whole thing to really create dimensional and textured characters that really kind of engage the audience and pull you in the different directions you need to all but just hit on the right money exactly every single possible time and of course the action in the film absolutely positively hits the mark because, like I said before, the martial arts aspect of the film was just so much... Where, where that was something that was originally envisioned when they were kind of developing the whole thing, or became much more of a thing when they got Snipes involved and knew what his background was in martial arts, it absolutely launched the film into another level to have that type of lead actor who can do all this type of stuff and just have great stunt performers and great choreographers and have the right way to stage, choreograph, and put together the action and post, everything came together. Absolutely positive. I love that they used different styles of fighting and whatnot, some soft style, some hard style, to match the sensibility and mentality of the characters, the psychology of them, where they, for like Deacon Frost, they chose something much more direct and straightforward type of stuff, and with the blade, something a little bit more sort of intricate in certain places, so... I just like the idea that they, they were very much knowledgeable about bringing in the right people to kind of train and kind of focus in the choreography and create a certain character and personality with it and everything. And how they put it all together in terms of cinematography and editing, I absolutely love, again, they use the wide angle, the, the, the wide anamorphic lenses here to frame things in a very wide type of aspect ratio so you can see all the action play out with all the, the kicks and the hits and all this type of stuff and all the swords and all the different weapons going off and the whole thing. You get that type of scope of the whole film where you can see all the action play out in wide angles and all the type of stuff and not have the thing cut too much. You get to see the impact of the hits over and over again. You're not like a hit and a cut, a hit and a cut. They're really much allowing the choreography to drive the action and trying to allow the choreography to play itself out instead of trying to force the action between the edits and trying to force the kineticness of everything else. It creates such a, such a fluid sensibility about the film. It feels very refreshing, just feels more real in a certain way. They really did a magnificent job to create a kinetic and fast-paced and energetic, stylish, but also refreshing type of action film and just like everything they had going on between that and some of the special effects in the film because a lot of the digital effects as great as the film is a lot of the digital effects are very very dated they're not as good quality as they possibly could have been at this point in time some of the stuff is good you get some of the stuff like when they have the entire thing down the uh the train tunnel and everything the subway tunnel that stuff looks really good where they got the entire train going on is complete cgi type of stuff they just kind of green screened everything off to do the action sequence just added in the train cars and all the type of stuff speeding by in post-production so that stuff always looked really good and there's a few little things that look all right but some of it de definitely seems start for budget and start for a little bit of quality maybe a little bit of uh longer post-production time but the fact that the rest of the film is so goddamn good i i've always been able to kind of leap past the the lower quality digital effects of the film because 
everything else just hits off so goddamn well that if there was a bunch of other stuff that just wasn't very good, whether it was some of the writing or direction or stuff like that, yeah, that would just be like kind of a death knell in the whole film, but everything else is on such a really tight, high, good quality level that, you know, the effects aren't terribly good, everything else is so goddamn good that got in the freaking movie, I can forgive that. Again, even if this is only Stephen Norton's second film, he's been in the film business for about almost maybe 18 years or whatnot at this point in time. So a lot of people with maybe not a lot of experience directing on their second feature film, especially one with this level of cast and this uh, type of budget of $45 million, maybe not everyone would kind of get as strong of a film out of themselves as Norrington did here, but obviously he had a lot of experience in the field of film and learn from a lot of good filmmakers in certain ways and just had a certain talent for it in a certain way just like everything he brought to the table in terms of his sensibility his own vision of everything just really kind of came together and David Goyer's script was really solid apparently as well so those two working together to craft the entire vision of the film and using all these good production designers and choreographers and the great cinematographer as well just like all the things fell into the right pieces and places even if the visual effects are very kind of lacking in a lot of places, everything came together so very well in this whole type of, type of thing that it kind of a shame that eventually Stephen Norrington had such a horrible experience doing the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen that it really kind of just turned him off from doing any more directorial features and whatnot. It's just like he really just had a really bad experience. And it's a shame because he's, he's a fan, from the evidence of just this film, he has fantastic talent for it. He has a fantastic vision to himself, and maybe stories have said that he is a bit of a difficult person to work with. He gets a little flustered under kind of larger uh, larger projects, whatnot, larger studio supervision, whatnot, but probably not the only one who's done that in Hollywood and had uh, good movies come out of it regardless. But anyway, I hope Stephen Norrington will eventually get another project going because he's kind of rescinded that sort of thing where he said he was never direct anything again but nothing's really kind of materialized for him since but uh if he can come back and do something anything close to this quality i'd be entirely for it so i love to get your comments below guys because uh kind of kind of okay with blade 2 I, I felt like like i said before i think they lost a little bit of the stoic brooding quality the, the stuff i really liked about the, the the weightiness the gravity of the character played in that film they went a little bit more lighter but it's still an okay film. It's pretty pretty entertaining type of stuff. Blade Trinity is pretty shitty. Uh, I saw the TV series that they put together that went on Spike TV for like one season. It's like, that was pretty alright. It was pretty okay. We didn't have Wesley Snipes. He had uh, rapper Sticky Fingers kind of going into the role and everything. But a few episodes I did see, I thought it was, thought it was an alright type of film uh, adaptation into a TV series. So, but... Ever since then, Wesley Snipes, since he got back out of his uh, tax evasion uh, jail time and all the type of stuff, has been lolling for another Blade film, and now the rights are back with Marvel Studios, and we'll see where maybe that eventually goes if they do anything with it. Uh, Snipes is still a spry type of guy. He can still do the action, just a matter of question if they want to go with a more established actor or they want to go a little bit younger towards more like uh, what they did with Chadwick Boseman on Black Panther, which Snipes was trying to get a Black Panther movie off the ground before he took on the Blade role. So guys, good type of stuff there to kind of move it all back around and everything. So guys, get your comments below, your thumbs up if you really enjoyed my look at Blade. And I kind of did this review because like we just hit 4,000 subscribers and it's like, I really love this movie, and I felt like it was about high time I talked a little blade with you guys. So, uh, thanks for checking out the channel, hitting the subscribes, the likes, checking things out, and just enjoying what I have to offer here, guys. So, thank you so deeply much. We'll be back with other great stuff soon. So, take care. Bye-bye.